We are live. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to uh, hit the record button on the podcast. So just uh, a little explanation here uh, for everyone. We are also, uh, while we're doing the YouTube live broadcast as we normally do, I am uh, recording this as well in a podcast version. I've gotten feedback really since we started doing Ask the Agronomist a year and a half ago. Occasionally I hear from people that, hey, that would make a good podcast. I would rather listen to it than watch it. And and I get that. I'm a I'm better radio guy than I am TV guy. So if you'd rather listen to me than look at me, I kind of I kind of get that. So um, so we are going to start putting this out as a podcast as well. So so I'm recording on my iPad the audio from this. Obviously, the visual component of this. I mean, we're bringing in. You know, we we haven't figured out a way to get you out in the field with us, but we are figuring out how we can bring the field into the office here. So we've got <clears throat> lots of visuals today, which I apologize to the podcast listener. They're going to miss out on the visual. But um, if you're listening to the podcast and you're thinking, well, I wish I could see that, you can always log on to YouTube Live and watch the recording just, just like you all are. So uh, just trying to reach more people, trying to get content out there in ways that people appreciate and, and people can get value out of. And, and I get feedback frequently that, you know, you need to do a podcast. So so, so we're going to do that. So, so we're recording the podcast. Uh, welcome, uh, podcast listeners. Uh, welcome to my YouTube live audience. So thanks again for, for joining. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to chat in questions, which we always hope you do, um, you know, be logged in to either on your YouTube account or uh, a Google um, a Gmail account, email account, so you can chat in questions live. If you don't want to chat in questions live, you can text them to Adam or whatever FSA you're working with, and and uh, or FSR rather. And if they're paying attention, they can uh, they can text us a question, and uh, you can always email me. Uh, won't we'll, won't we'll get your emails live during the uh, broadcast, but just as a reminder, just my name, Lance. Period. Tarchione, T-A-R-O-C-H-I-O-N-E, at bear.com. You can email me suggestions, comments, questions, critiques. Uh, I, do, I do get feedback occasionally via email of, of ideas for the for the broadcast. I really appreciate those. So today is going to have a, <clears throat> a pretty strong fungicide um, flair to it. Uh, I get dozens of questions um, daily about you know, how should I manage fungicide? And I, and I understand from your perspective how easily it would be to get confused because I'm, I'm going to list off the corn growth stages that I have heard somebody say you should use fungicide. So, so here goes. V5, well, well, let's back up. V4, V5, V6, V7, V10, V12, V14, VT, R1, R2, brown silk, green silk, uh, R3, R4, R5. So, so that pretty well covers the entire growing season. You could find somebody out there making a recommendation to apply a fungicide at those timings, sometimes multiple of those timings. And then you combine in all the different products you could choose from, all the different rates of those products that you could choose, and if you're going to do multiple applications, do you apply the same thing two or three times? Do you switch it up? Do you do tank mixtures? You know, how, how do you how do you do this? And and there's just a tremendous amount of confusion out there. We, we are going to share. I'm going to share my opinions of how it's best to manage fungicide. There are <clears throat> other people that will probably have different positioning, different opinions. I, I would say you should first and foremost go with the recommendation being given to you by the manufacturer of the product that you're using. So products are different. Companies are different. Companies have different philosophies of what they want to promote. Uh, agronomists have different opinions on, you know, try to get five agronomists to agree on anything is, is, is a challenge. And so even within Bayer, I'm not going to say that everybody agrees perfectly with, with my positioning on fungicides. So, so I get why it's confusing. I get why it's frustrating, and and I get why it's it's hard to know what to do. And, and then you know there is a bit of a, a a judgment call gray area. It's not black and white. There's a lot of personal preferences. You know, just what's your attitude towards fungicide? How aggressive do you want to be? How much money you're willing to spend? 
how worried are you about something happening to the crop? What's it worth to you to defend that crop? Th those are all more personal decisions than they are agronomic decisions. And so it just gets really complicated to figure all that out. So, so I'm going to start with staging the crop first. I've got a fairly long list of stuff up here. I, I hope you guys asked so many questions today. We don't even get through my list, but um, that's kind of the list of what we're going to talk about. And then we'll, we'll sprinkle in your questions as we go. So <clears throat> the, the first thing I'm going to touch on is a, is a practice that I strongly recommend. And that is what I call predicting when the field will be ready for fungicide. And, and what I encourage growers to do is to scout your fields prior to tassel. I'm going to show you how to do that here in a second with this plant that I brought in. This plant's not tasseling yet. I, I just cut it off about halfway, halfway down. My neighbor donated this plant to us this morning as I was driving, as I was driving in. And you can take a plant that's not tasseling yet, and you can predict what day it's going to tassel, probably within plus or minus two days either way. And if you're that close, it doesn't really matter. So, so if you say that this plant's going to tassel in a week, and I want my corn sprayed when it starts to tassel in a week, and they're there two days before that or two days after that, I, I don't care. That, that's so close to perfect timing. It's, it's, it's all in the window. It, it's all good. So <clears throat> what I encourage growers to do is get, get out of the, the habit of waiting till the corn is ready to spray and then turning the order in. Because by that time, you're too far down on the list and your crop's not going to get sprayed as timely as it could have. So I would have this conversation with your retail supplier and make sure they're having it with the aerial applicator or whoever's driving the ground rig, whoever's making that application. Make sure you're all on the same page. But I think as growers, we can do more to help them manage the workload by predicting when the field is going to tassel and being OK with whenever it gets sprayed, as long as it's close to tassel. So, so don't try to micromanage that too much. So, so here's this corn plant that is not tasseled yet. Here, here is the whirl that we can pull out of the top of this plant. So I'm going to pull out everything that hasn't leafed out yet. So can you see that? <clears throat> and then what you do is you just start to unroll these leaves and you figure out, well, how many leaves are there until you get down to the tassel? So here's the first leaf that's next to come out. So there's one. Here is the second leaf that's next to come out. There is two. And this is probably the flag leaf because I can feel the tassel inside of it. And it is. So there's your flag leaf. So there's three. So I'm going to say this plant is three leaves from tasseling. This time of year, it takes about two to three days per leaf. So if you figure two and a half days per leaf on average, this plant's going to tassel in roughly a week. About seven and a half days, this tassel is going to be probably not fully emerged, but it will be out. And <clears throat> within a week or less, this plant will be far enough along that it's safe to spray. So it will be in the early VT stage. Our recommended stage for fungicide is VT to R1. So <clears throat> R1 is pollination. At R1, you've got pollen flying and your silks are very, very, very fresh and green. Somewhat like this plant. So this plant would be a plant that that tassel is not fully out. It is not in full pollen shed. The, the main spike is shedding, but most of these branches have not shed any pollen yet. There is pollen flying in this field, but it's going to get a lot heavier pollen, you know, over the next few days. This plant to me is exactly at the right stage to spray. This is right in the sweet spot of VT to R1. I'll show you another one. This has just a little bit different look to it because the silk's not out. 
A lot of times with modern hybrids, you'll get silks before you get tassels these days. This plant is silking a little bit late, so you've got a tassel that's fully out. Some plants do a pretty good job of tassel. This one's kind of doing that. From, from the road, this field didn't look like it had a lot of tassels, but the leaves kind of cover up that tassel, and the whole tassel is not sticking up above the top of the plant. So this plant, even though there's no silks, even though there's not much pollen shedding, this plant's ready to spray. It is in the VT growth stage. You are not going to injure this plant, no matter what kind of, you know, surfactant or adjuvant you put in with your strobilia and fungicide. You're not going to injure this plant by, by spraying it at this stage of growth. We'll talk about what stage of growth you can injure corn. We'll also talk about is it the surfactant or is it the fungicide or can it be both? We'll talk about ground rigs versus aerial application. We'll talk about high volume versus low volume. There's just a tremendous amount of you know, fear and misinformation around, you know, what caused the problem nearly 15 years ago when strobies caused arrested ear uh, development and, and what triggers that and what could cause that to happen still today. Lance, you're probably yeah. going to cover some of this, but Dirk Dr. Full wrote in. Hi, Dirk Dr. Full. Nice to see you again. Um, he says, when you don't see any disease, a VT and weather is dry. Yep. Very tempting to push application That's back. Right. That's right. right? Yep. Uh, to say when conditions might be more favorable for disease, you might be able to get more out of your fungicide. Thoughts yep. on that? Yep. Okay. So, so great question. And and this happens a lot to people who scout. Uh, if you're in your fields a lot uh, scouting and and you notice that there's not much disease pressure there, and and that's a good uh, addition that it's been kind of dry. So you've got, you know, the dry weather probably delaying the onset of disease. And if you can wait till brown silk to spray that fungicide before the disease gets started, you know, wouldn't that be better? So, so I got an example here of a plant that is approaching brown silk. See, it's got some brown silks on it. Still got some green silks too. And this plant, this would be a good example of what of what Dirk Dr. Full is talking about. There's no disease on this plant. There's some insect feeding, there's some etching, there's some scrapes, there's some you know wind damage, there's you know, but there's there's not really any disease pressure on this plant. This plant is, I'm gonna say R2. So if we pull that ear off, also donated by a neighbor of mine, by the way, who planted earlier than, than I did. I don't have any corn this far along. So, so yeah, those, you see those kernels there? That's the blister stage. So, so that's an R2. That, that plant is essentially done pollinating. You might still be pollinating a few out here on the tip. So if, you're, if your window is VT to R1, and, and that's, that's the sweet spot in our opinion, you're out of the window with this plant. So, so are there green silks here? Yes. Are they all brown? No. Um, are they as brown as they're gonna get? No but it's already a little on the late side if you're targeting VT to R1. Now let's address the good question that was asked. So the, the reason I am hesitant to make that application to wait is there's two or three reasons. The plant health benefits of the strobilia and fungicides, which is a big part of the reason I apply fungicide, have been tested the most and shown to have the most benefit in that VT to R1 stage. Because the most stressful point of this plant's life is two weeks after pollination. And if you're going to benefit that plant the most from the stress relieving properties of a stroby fungicide, two weeks after pollination is the most likely time that the plant's gonna get that benefit out of that. And you know, all of the data that was done on the strobies years ago when they first came out, that VT to R1 timing was the one that showed the most consistent beneficial response. So that's not talking about disease control specifically. That's the plant health component of strobies. If you're not using a strobilia and fungicide, if you're just using triazoles, if you're maybe using some generic products and, and creating your own cocktail of, of triazole products, um, you know, then that's not really a, a, an issue because you're not using a stroby. Uh, from a pure disease control standpoint, the argument that Dr. Full was making is, is valid. If you could wait 
to make that application. You don't want to wait until after the disease has started because that, that's a little too late. That's the other reason I don't make this recommendation because I, I think people tend to, when they wait, it's just like spraying weeds and soybeans. When people wait, they wait too long. And, and what they think is too early is just right. And what a lot of people think is just right, I would argue is too late. And so it's, it's so easy to get too late if you delay. I, I don't really make that recommendation to delay. So I like that VT to R1 timing. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the delaying that application. I mean, yes, could, could you extend the protection later in the season? If you, yes, if you apply two weeks later, your protection is going to go two weeks later into the season. So, so that's, that, that makes sense to me. But if you apply two weeks after the plant would have liked to have had the product for maximum benefit, I think you're missing out on some of those plant health benefits um, that, that, that we know are real. Um, might be a great idea specifically to, to disease control, but, but I'm not sure it's as good a recommendation for plant health. So there, there's a lot of people that subscribe to that theory, and you'll have a lot of, of good agronomists that will argue with me on that and, and people that say, no, if you're using a product like, you know, Delaro is a good example. Delaro has a very, very good triazole in it and a very, very high rate of that very good triazole. Well, the triazoles are the, are the curatives. The strobies are the preventatives. So the strobies are the ones that you need to have out there before disease infection. The triazoles are the ones that can still help you with disease control after disease infection. And so if you've got a really good triazole, so I, I've heard people make this argument with our product that, well, you know, you got a good triazole, shouldn't I put it on later and take advantage of that residual and take advantage of that length of control and take advantage of that good triazole? That is an argument you can make. It's, it's not my preferred way to manage it. I would rather stay on the early side. And, and if we're getting hit with a, a year like 2021, where we've got intensely heavy disease pressure late, I, I think you're going to need, you know, either higher rates or sequential applications are a more effective way to manage that than dragging your feet on that first application. Another related question to that is, well, you know, should I put more than eight ounces out there? So, so every product has their standard use rate and most products have a full use rate, which tends to be in most cases about 50% higher than the standard use rate. That's the case with our Delaro. Standard use rates, eight ounces, maximum label rates, 12 ounces. Maximum amount you can apply during a growing season is 24. So you could... If you wanted to be super aggressive, you could apply 12 ounces twice after tassel. You could apply four at V5, followed by 10, followed by 10. Uh, you can get to 24 in, in any way you want to, but 24 ounces. So that's the other thing to watch on the product you're using. They all have a maximum use rate and they all have a maximum amount in a growing season rate as well. And, and you don't want to exceed either one. If you're tank mixing, be careful with that too, because if you're using a, a standard rate of product A and you throw in a half of a rate or a standard rate of some generic stroby, just trying to get some additional residual, you may get too much fungicide on that plant at one time and, and get into uh, an, an injury scenario. So uh, especially be careful with, you know, throwing things together that, you know, neither one of the companies has probably tested the mix that you just made. It might not be technically off label, but if it's not on the label, that means it hasn't been tested by either company. So just, just be aware, um, you know, we got a really good corn crop out there. We got lots of potential. We got high prices. It'd be a shame to booger it up, uh, overdoing it on, on fungicide. So, um, with with that in mind, let's let's talk a little bit about the the injury potential. So there's there's two schools of thought on on where that comes from. Um, there is the school of thought that it is the strobilia and fungicide inhibiting ethylene production in the plant. And we've got Adam here with us today. And, and Adam spent a lot of years with Dr. Bilo, and Dr. Bilo at U of I has looked a lot into that ethylene suppression aspect of strobilia and fungicides, which is typically a positive. But if you drop that ethylene uh, production level too low prior to tassel, you know, you can screw up ear development. 
And the other um, probably more common theory that you hear talked about is, well, it wasn't the fungicide at all. It was the surfactant. It was impurities and surfactants. The, the surfactant manufacturers have cleaned up those impurities. We've quit using those non-ionic surfactants that cause the problem. And as long as you're not using non-ionic surfactant, you don't have to worry about a thing. So, th so there's two issues with that that I, that, that I am concerned about. One, fungicides work better with adjuvants. And, and a lot of people, uh, out of fear of causing injury, don't want to use adjuvants with fungicides. And two, if it is the ethylene um, production inhibition that's causing the problem, that still happens. Um, and just taking the, the surfactant out isn't going to change that. So for those two reasons, we do not recommend at Bayer applications of Delaro, Delaro Complete before tassel, unless you're talking V5, V6, V7, V8. So so we do make recommendations for early foliar fungicide from V4 up to V8. So that's the window I prefer like V5, V6, but V4 to V8 would, would be the big window for those early applications. And then if you read our label from V8 to VT, we do not recommend application of a fungicide. There are a lot of companies that disagree with that. There are a lot of products that are being promoted, being sprayed on you know five foot tall corn, shoulder high corn. The most probable time to cause arrested ear syndrome, if you're going to ding a plant with a fungicide, is V14 to V18. And this would be about, you know, V18 would be about two weeks-ish before tassel. So the front side of this is probably about four weeks ish before tassel. So <clears throat> there's probably nothing wrong with spraying fungicide on waist high corn at V10, V12. Um, I don't think that's a great time to do it because it's too early to, you know, Dirt Dr. Full asked the question about waiting later than VT to R1. Well, if sometimes you think it's a good idea to wait later than VT to R1, why would you want to be out there at V10 to V12 spraying waist high corn? Probably not going to hurt anything, but I'm not sure where the benefit is in, in that timing. As you slide into this V14 to V18 window, whether you're using surfactant or not, we believe there is still a slight chance under some environmental conditions that you know people don't really understand that you can cause some arrested ear development. So I think there's a perception out there that the ear injury, question Adam? I would say let's just so everybody understands what we mean by arrested ear, let's let's yep. define that just a little bit. Yeah, no, good, good, good call out. There's a lot so, of different ear abnormalities, so, and so so when when we talk about you know arrested ear, you maybe have heard of beer can ear. That those to me, arrested ear would be kind of a large, broad category, and and that's kind of just a, a an, an ear that did not develop properly because something happened to it during the development stage. It could be a beer can ear. It could be an ear that's pinched. It could be an ear that, you know, the, the, the rows are abnormal on. Most of those ear abnormalities have nothing to do with pollination problems. Those ear abnormalities are during the formation of the ovule or the kernel on the ear, which is happening long before the plant ever shot a tassel or shed pollen. And I think most people have the perception, I perceive that there is a perception that, that something going on during pollination is what caused those problems. And so when corn is pollinating, people, people get nervous about spraying things on corn. If it's not pollinating yet, they're not worried about it. Well, ironically, the, the stage that you're most likely to cause a problem is long before pollination, you know, about two to four weeks before pollination. So if we go back in time to, I don't remember what year it was, um, but that year, about 15 years ago, when there were some ground rig applications made prior to tassel, and there was a lot of injury with, with stroby, you know, a lot, we just had straight strobies at that time. Most people were, you know, products like Headline and Quadris were pretty new at that time. There weren't a lot of premixes. Nobody was using a three-way premix. Most people weren't even using a, a triazole yet, at least not as a premix. Tilt was around. Tilt was a straight triazole. 
tilt had been used pre-tassel in seed fields for a long time. Never had an issue. Strobies came out, different chemistry, you know, has a lot of benefits, uh, but it just, it does things in the plant that triazoles don't do. So in those early days of strobies, people, you know, accidentally ding some corn. And, and those applications were generally always with a ground rig. And to my knowledge, they were always pre-tassel. I'm, I'm not really aware of a post-tassel application of a fungicide that ever caused any, you know, ear damage or, or ear, um, you know, formation issues. Because at that time, the ear's already formed. You know, it hasn't pollinated yet, but the ovules are there, the ear's formed. And if, you're, and if you've got an arrested ear, you're going to have a short cob in many cases. You're going to have an ear that just doesn't look right. The, the shucks may be short on the ear. You could have the, the, the cob or the ear growing out the end of the husk. You could get a bouquet ear, which is where you've got a bunch of ear tillers, essentially. And it makes a little bouquet of small ears. and None of them are normal. They're, they're all abnormal. But that's all happening during the ear length determination phase, which starts at about V8 and goes to about V18-ish. So from V8 to V18 is, is when that ear is, is forming and you keep adding kernels onto that ear as you go. And during this stage, that plant is determining, is it gonna try to make a 50 long ear? Is it gonna try to make a 40 long ear? Is it gonna try to make a 30 long ear? Or are you going to end up with this little beer can thing that's 18 long? And, and those, that damage is occurring somewhere in this V8 to V18 growth stage. And, and that's primarily why at Bear we do not recommend applications of strobe fungicides with or without surfactant, with or without adjuvants, prior to tassel. Now, I do think that it is wise, and I, and I know a lot of people make this recommendation, if you choose to apply before tassel, or if your field is uneven and 10% of your field hasn't tasseled yet, and you're going to go ahead and make that application, if you pull the adjuvants out, you're going to be less likely to see the injury. Why? Because you're not going to get as much fungicide into the plant without the adjuvant. So fungicides are no different than herbicides. They work better with adjuvants. I'm not aware of a fungicide label that does not recommend an adjuvant. Now they may not recommend non-onyx surfactant, but they're probably gonna recommend an adjuvant of some kind. So adjuvants is, a, is the big category. So non-onyx surfactants are one group of adjuvants. Crop oil is an adjuvant. <clears throat> a water conditioning agent is an adjuvant. A deposition agent is an adjuvant, and a lot of adjuvant suppliers have developed products which are very safe for use with fungicides, and they were developed after this these arrested ear issues, and after surfactants got blamed for that, they developed special fungicides, or sorry, special adjuvants for use with fungicides. Now, <clears throat> if you're waiting till the corn has tasseled, you can use whatever, you know, cheap non-extrafactant you want with that fungicide and not worry about injury because the plant is at a stage of development where that injury is not going to occur. If you feel better about using the special safer product that was developed just for fungicides, that's cool. Those will work. You know, we definitely recommend use of an adjuvant with a fungicide because for fungicides to be at their most effective, you don't just need to get them on the leaf. You need to get them in the leaf. And, and that's what the fun, that's what the surfactant does or the adjuvant does is help get more of the active ingredient off of the waxy cuticle of the leaf, penetrating through that to get into the leaf. And if you, you hear people talk about locally systemic, translaminar movement, moving through the leaf. All that happens in the leaf. It doesn't happen on the leaf. So if you don't get the fungicide into the leaf, none of that stuff that you hear people talk about is, is going to happen. 
So, <clears throat> so adjuvants should be used with fungicides. You do want to be careful with your timing. You want to be careful with what adjuvant you choose. If you wait till that VT timing where you've got some tassel coming out, doesn't have to be fully out, doesn't have to be shedding pollen. Shouldn't be done pollinating because if you're done pollinating, that means you're in the R2 stage. And if you're shooting for VT to R1, you're, you're already late. And that's without a 10 day of delay that we sometimes get into because you're not at the top of the list on, on the application list. So the, the amount of work that we've got to get done in a short period of time is another reason that I, that I like to get out there earlier and I like to be ahead of the game because, you know, if, if we have some weather delays, I mean, last year we had the smoky smoggy days when we couldn't fly. There, sometimes it's too hot to fly. Sometimes it's too windy to fly. Sometimes it's too rainy to fly. You, know, you start losing application days, and pretty soon that guy that was only two days out, now he's a week out. And, and if you didn't ask him to come until your corn was already at the tail end of the window, very quickly, you know, we sprayed a lot of corn last year, got its first shot at the R3, R4 stage. I mean, it was like roasting ear stage or dough stage. It, it would have been too chewy for sweet corn. By the time the first application of fungicide went on, if you want to do a two shot program, that might be close to the timing that you'd like to have on the second shot. But if that's your first application, you've given that disease way too much of a head start on, on that crop. And, and I don't care how good your triazole is or how high a rate of triazole you have. If you've already got disease lesions up and down the plant, uh, you're, you're, you're too late with that application. So we got to be out there ahead of these diseases. Uh, the fungicides work best when they're, when they're used as a preventative, even if they're a curative product, curative products do a better job, you know, preventing disease uh, than they do fixing it after it's already happened, because there is no, there, uh, people treat fungicides like there's a third category that I call resurrective. There, there, there are no resurrective fungicides. Once the disease lesion is there, it's going to do nothing but get bigger. You can't pull it back in at that point. So, so even the curative products need to be on before you can see a lot of disease lesions and the preventative products need to be on even before that. So any questions coming in, Adam? Um, not right now. We've got okay. some, I did have one question that came in and it has a little bit to do with, uh, you know, some ground versus air yeah. injury potential type yep. questions. Yep. Yep. He had, he had a question about, you know, some helicopter application and whether or not the the down pressure from yeah. the helicopter is blowing the plants over and therefore not potentially getting the fungicide dispersed on the right uh -huh. part of the okay. plant. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> so so I'm gonna I'm gonna address the because I forgot to mention the um the the injury potential um aspect of, of ground versus air. So so I think ground rigs have gotten an unfair rap when it comes to injury potential. And there are, I've talked to growers that if they have it in their head, that if I don't use a ground rig, I can't hurt my corn. Uh, and, and flip, and the inverse of that, if I do use a ground rig, I've got a better chance of hurting my corn. Uh, there's also people that feel if I use 20 gallon of the acre versus two gallon of the acre, I got a better chance of hurting my corn. I don't think any of that is true. I think that's all just stuff we made up in our head, you know, people that, you know, have put theories out there that really have not been tested or verified and somebody heard something and it just kind of stuck with them. So, so the reason it appeared as though ground rigs had something to do with the injury that happened back in the day was it was only ground rig applications that were getting made in this V14 to V18 window that was causing the problem. Nobody was spraying fields with a plane at this stage. And the reason they were spraying them at this stage was that corn's about that tall. And that's the biggest they could get over with a traditional ground rig. They didn't have a true high boy. They didn't want to use a plane. They wanted to use their ground rig sprayer. So they waited as long as they could and still get over the corn with that ground rig. So it didn't have anything to do with the fact it was a ground rig. I don't think it had anything to do with the fact it was a 15 to 20 gallon application. I also talk to people that think that, well, it's that volume that you got that stuff down in there and it got down in the world and it got down to the ear and it got did this, did that because of the volume. I don't think that's true either. It's the timing that caused the problem and the product that caused the problem, not the method of application. 
if you would have been spraying corn with a plane at V16 at two gallon of the acre, I think you would have got the same amount of injury. So I don't think it's the ground rig's fault, and I don't think it's the high volume application's fault that things happened. It's the timing's fault, and in some cases, you know, the chemistry or maybe the the adjuvant that was with it that contributed to that. But it's first and foremost the timing. If you do not put that product in that plant during that sensitive time, the odds of anything bad happening are, are just just about zero. So. So that, that's what I would say about the, the, the risk of using a ground rig. So, so Adam's question was more along the lines of what's the best way to do it? Are there <clears throat> differences between the application methods and, and are you getting more or less coverage depending on what you choose? There are differences uh, in a year like last year with intense disease pressure probably the heaviest disease pressure I've ever seen, you know, in, in my career, application uniformity, rate, coverage, and penetration into the canopy were all vitally important to the outcome of your fungicide application. In a normal year for us, where a lot of our benefits coming from plant health benefits, not necessarily disease control, because normally we don't have that much disease pressure, having a perfectly uniform application and getting it penetrated into the lower canopy, yeah, it's nice, but it's probably not all that critical. Last year, if you saw any streaks in fields where you have these dead strips, green strips, that could in some cases have been caused by a non-uniform application across the field, but, but there's been a lot of work done shown that the application was more uniform than it looked like, but what wasn't uniform was the amount of penetration you got down into the canopy. And with any aerial application, you're getting better canopy penetration right underneath the bird. So, so where the below the fuselage of the plane and below the wings of the plane, where the, where the downforce is helping force that product down into the canopy, it's getting down into the canopy better versus out on the wings. Same thing with a helicopter, right underneath the rotor. Where that, where that wind gust is going down and where that corn's doing all this, you're getting better penetration into that canopy. And, and that's why we tended to see those you know, brown dead strips on the, on the edges of the swath from some of those aerial applications because it didn't do as good a job getting down into the canopy. Now, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the product that you used impacted that. The timing that you applied it impacted that. The rate that you used impacted it a lot, but we saw a lot of that streaking. We see less streaking from those ground rig applications. I think they do a better job getting a uniform application on the field. Do not hear me say that I'm opposed to aerial application because I am absolutely not, because the reality is we're going to spray more acres by air than we ever will with ground rig equipment. If you have access to ground rig equipment, and you don't mind spending two or three weeks of your summer driving through big corn, more power to you. You know, it's a good way to put product on. It's a nice option to have. If your field's muddy, not gonna work. If your field's root lodged, not gonna work. In some cases, if your corn's too tall, not gonna work. Um, so there are limitations to ground equipment. The number one limitation is we just can't get across the acres. So we need airplanes, we need helicopters, we need ground rigs. I am, I am uh, a fan of all three methods of application. The only thing I'm not a fan of is not doing anything. So if, if you did something, that's better than doing nothing, especially in a year like last year. Uh, it's, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I don't even like to fly in normal planes, let alone spray planes. Now, Adam here, he's, he's, a, he, he's a daredevil at heart. He, he'd probably like to go for a ride in a, in a spray plane. I love it. Anyone wants to take me for a ride, I'll just put this out there. I, yeah, <laughs> you, the, the uh, you, you, you would you you would need a a, a land sized puke bag uh, if you put me up in a in a in a spray plane. So don't do that. <clears throat> um, you, you know, for 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 what we ask them to do, to me, the aerial applicators do do a great job. You know, and everything we do trying to get them to do a better job is going to slow them down. And I think the number one problem we have with fungicide applications, especially in corn, is timeliness. 
and getting that application made timely is probably equally important to getting it made well. So, so we make some concessions on quality of application. I mean, would it be nice if they trim all the ends on every field? Would it be nice if they narrowed up their swath width? Would it be nice if they sprayed three or four gallon instead of two? Yes, but we already have a hard time getting the work done. So, so, so give your applicators some grace on, on fungicide applications. You know, when, when, when you ask a guy to spray a 17 acre field, it's got trees on three sides and power lines on one end. You know, wh why would you expect it to get well sprayed? It's impossible. You know, you, you can't be right above the crop in that field where, where you need to be. And that might be a field that, you know, maybe you should use a ground rig. Maybe you shouldn't spray it at all because because small fields kind of suck with a ground rig, too, because you're doing lots of turning. You're running over lots of corn. There are people that are that are doing some testing with well, maybe UAV applications someday will be those those little fields that are hard for anybody to do. You know, maybe a maybe a drone is the best way to apply fungicide in, in some of those fields like that. So there are people looking at that as well. But but just just keep in mind. You know, if, if it's a field with a lot of obstacles and and they're going to be applying a lot of product 50 to 70 feet above the canopy of the crop, you know, that that's not going to be a particularly good quality application. But there ain't any other way to do it if if unless you want to fly through the trees, which does not work. So <clears throat> just just keep that in mind, too, that, you know, some fields are a lot easier to spray than others. And if it's a field with a lot of obstacles, uh, you're not going to get as good a quality application. And then it's your decision. You know, is it worth spraying that field, knowing that half of it's not going to get done right? Or would you rather just not spray that one and, and maybe target that one for, for an earlier harvest? So uh, I, I, I hope I haven't offended any applicators with any of those comments because that, that is not my intent. Uh, I, I'm not going to spend any time arguing over, you know, which method of aerial application is, is better. Um, we need our aerial applicators. They got a hard job to do. Um, I, I wouldn't want to be living their life. And, and we all need to work with them. So with that, um, let's see, we've talked about stage. We haven't talked about stage and beans yet. So I want to do that. We've talked about adjuvants. We've talked about arrested ear and injury development. We've talked about fungicide timing. Ground versus air, rest here. Okay, so so a couple things here on the list. Um, get, get a lot of questions every year about addition of insecticide. In soybeans, addition of insecticide is almost just just automatic. In corn, it tends to be more of a you know sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Do I see beetles? Do I do I am I worried about rootworm populations? You know, do I have a lot of Japanese beetles? You know, what's the corn price? You know, what what what's my attitude? Um, I think there's probably situations where there would be a benefit to an insecticide along with the corn fungicide. Um, you know, the timing of that application is, is, is somewhat important in that. If you're, if you're applying late, your corn's been pollinated for three weeks, eh, you know, it might be less of a benefit to putting that insecticide in, in, in that case. Uh, if you're before pollination and you're seeing a lot of beetles, uh, I've been in fields where I've seen a lot of stink bugs. Uh, I've seen a lot of Japanese beetles. I've seen some rootworm beetles. You know, there, there, there is a population of insects out there that we can control. Um, there are situations where, you know, you had a low level of two or three species of insect that really weren't hurting that much. You, you go ahead and put the insecticide in, you kill those insects, but you also kill the beneficial insects. And then all of a sudden you've got you know, uh, corn leaf aphid, you know, population skyrocket in your field because you killed off all the beneficials that were eating those corn leaf aphids. And if you hadn't put that insecticide in, those beneficials might have kept those leaf aphids from being a problem. So, so there are absolutely situations where you could end up creating a problem by trying to fix a problem that didn't really need to be fixed. But that's really, really, really difficult to predict when that's going to happen. It's pretty rare that we're at threshold levels of any insect pest in corn when we're spraying fungicide so that it looks like a no brainer. Now, Northern Illinois, which is being carried away by, by corn rootworm pressure, you know, that's a different story up there. Those guys have got enormous populations of corn rootworm beetles. And if you can kill half of your corn rootworm beetles and prevent half of your egg laying, 
there might be a tremendous value in, in doing that just to try to get that population a little more under control. We don't have that issue here. So for us, it's primarily Japanese beetles that people are looking at. And if their populations aren't really high, you know, they're probably not doing enough damage to justify putting that product in. And they're hard to kill sometimes too. So sometimes you don't really get a great kill on Japanese beetle with that economical three or four dollar an acre product that you would like to throw in there. It might be more like a seven or eight or ten dollar an acre product that you would want if you're trying to get really good control of Japanese beetles. And, and at that price point, you may go, eh, I, I'll, I'll pass on that. That's another you know, very personal decision for you to make is where do you stop? You're there with the plane, right? You're spending a lot of money to fly across the field. You've got a lot of money in your fungicide. By the time you get your adjuvants and your fungicide and your application, you know, you're already at a, at a pretty high price point to make that management decision. Do you spend another five bucks while you're there on insecticide? Do you spend another $5 on a foliar product? Do you spend another $5 on top of that on another foliar product? Do you use a $10 product? I mean, you can, you know, you, you look at it, you go, well, corn's, you know, corn's going to be $6-ish a bushel. I only got to get a bushel to pay for this $6 product. Surely it's worth a bushel, right? Well, there's somebody going to have data that says, yeah, it's worth two or three bushels. So great, I'm tripling my money. So, you know, if, if you start throwing in everything that somebody tells you is going to triple your money, you're going to have a 50 or $60 an acre treatment with, with one fungicide application. And some crazy guy like me is going to tell you, you might want to do it twice. So you got to draw the line somewhere. And, and I can't tell you where that line is for you. I, I can't tell you what kind of yield increase you're going to get out of insecticide. I can't tell you what kind of yield increase you're going to get out of a foliar fertilizer product. I, I can't tell you how many different foliar fertilizer products you ought to use. Uh, you're going to get recommendations from people on all that stuff. I, I use those products as well. I'm, I, I get the logic that, gosh, while I'm there, if, if I can do something that's going to make my crop better, I, I want to do that. And, you know, the crop value is pretty high. So it, it feels like my chance of getting a positive return on investment is pretty good. So <clears throat> let, let's give it a whirl. Um, you know, most of us don't leave you know, check strips. And even if you do leave a check strip, if you've got four products in that tank and you leave a check strip and it's 20 bushels less, was that 20 bushel from the fungicide and the other three things didn't do squat? Was it 10 from the fungicide and 10 from the other products? Was it 15 and five? Was it 18 and two? I don't have a clue. And, and it's really hard to do, you know, impossible, frankly, to do, you know, the type of study you would have to do to know, okay, which one of the things in that tank got me, how much yield did I get from each thing? So we tend to put that concoction out there. And, and if the yield response was big enough to pay for everything that was in the tank, plus the application and leave some money in our pocket, we're happy. And at the end of the year, we really don't know, you know, how much did we get from each one of those things that was in the tank. And, and that takes some pretty difficult research that almost nobody is doing to try to figure out, okay, which, which one of those components is, you know, it's a, it would be an aerial application form of, a, of an omissions trial, Adam, which you've been involved with in the past. And uh, omissions work is done with backpack sprayers and, and small plot equipment, not with, uh, not with airplanes. So um, it's, and, and I've seen people, you know, you can actually backpack fungicides. Um, that's not a, that's not a good day's work, man, because you're suited up in a, in a really unpleasant Tyvek suit with a, with a hand boom, with an extension on it, walking through corn, rain and fungicide and whatever else you're spraying down on yourself, walking through that thing, holding that hand boom up above that, above that corn crop. Um, that's a, that's a good job for a young graduate student that's hungry and trying to get that degree is, uh, is who does that sort of work. If you really get a good Lance, you actually, you know, can calibrate yourself to hold that boom over your back at mm -hmm. the right angle, you know, just, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's a been there, done that. <laughs> smart man speaking from experience. There, if you shoot it out behind you, then you don't have to walk through all of it. All you gotta have is the right little right angle. Yeah. Right uh -huh. angle. Yeah. Well, you get better application when you got that nozzle at a forty-five degree angle too. So every, everybody knows that. Let's uh, let's stage some soybeans. So so we've uh, we've talked. You know, typical Illinois fashion. We spent fifty minutes on corn. We're going to spend the last five or 10 minutes on soybeans. So 
So I, uh, I brought in a couple soybean plants here with me this morning. Um, one, one of them is mine. One of them donated by a unsuspecting customer on the, on the drive in this morning. So, so we start at the top of the plant. There is our first leaf with three formed leaflets. So those are not full size. So there's full size. Here's this one. This one counts. So that's one. This one does not count because they are not unfolded. They are not formed yet. So that does not count. Here, this one counts. You follow that down. There's the node where that top leaflet's attached. Then all we got to do is count. We got to count to four. Two, three, four. So right down here is the fourth node. You don't count the 10 other little nodes up here that haven't formed yet. You got one, two, three, four. We've got massive amounts of blooms. Nice to see that. You get down here to the fourth node, there are some itty bitty little baby pods there. And, and this plant is just, I'm going to say, right at the early R3 stage. That's a, you're looking for a 3 16 inch, you know, slightly less than a quarter inch pod down there. This, this plant, I'm going to say it's probably late R2, but it's arguable. Yeah, so Adam says turn it around. So, so there's the, those aren't just blooms. There's itty bitty little pods there. Now you go up here to third node, there's still blooms. So, so this plant is, if you're shooting for R3, this is the earliest I'd want to spray. Now the window is R2 to R4, and you'll get smart people arguing over, well, you know, if you can't hit it just right at R3, are you better off to be a little late or a little early? I don't know. It can depend on the lots of factors. You never know. But I would say that just like VT to R1 in corn, the odds of something good happening to your yield are best at the R3 stage. So I don't think R2 is better than R3. You know, R2 lets you get the work done quicker. You know, I don't know that R4 is, is bad, but the data would say it's not as good as R3. So R3 can seemingly last forever in some cases because this plant's still growing, right? So, so today, this is the node that matters. In two days, this node doesn't matter anymore because now this one appears the fourth node. So in two or three days, these blooms are going to be an itty bitty little pod, just like these are. And then two or three days after that, this node's the one that matters. And you keep moving up the plant. So these beans have got a lot of growing left to do. So how many of you have been concerned about how short your beans are? How many of you would be willing to make a bet with me that by the time September gets here, your beans are chest high and falling over? And, and the days of you worrying about them being too short have now turned into, damn, these things got too tall again and they're laying over on me and I wish it would be that damn tall. Uh, these plants got a lot of growing left to do. So personally, I'm a little bit hesitant to be too early because if you put fungicide on this plant today, half of the plant is never going to get fungicide because half the plant's not here yet. And that product is not going to move up into that new growth of, of this plant. They just don't do that. So, so I think we're a little early to be putting fungicide on in soybeans. Now, there are some fields that need some wheat control. And you're probably going to be tempted to say, well, you know, I'm getting ready to make an off-label herbicide application. So I think maybe I'll tank mix um, fungicide with it and make it more off-label. Um, so just, just be aware that we shouldn't really ever be putting fungicide and herbicide together um, because the, the timing is, you know, you're either too early for the fungicide or you're off-label on the herbicide. Uh, I might have said that wrong. You're too early for the fungicide, off-label for the herbicide being too late for the herbicide. So <clears throat> it might be fine to tank mix them, but you, your, your timing probably isn't, isn't going to be the best. So you know, if you've got some volunteer corn to clean up, that, that might be different. Uh, those, those products uh, might, might be still on label. But if you're talking Dicamba, Liberty, or 2,4-D, uh, or even Roundup for that matter, um, by the time you're in the right stage for the fungicide, you're off label with all those herbicide products. And in the case of everything except Roundup, you've been off label for about a month. So, so we, we really shouldn't be putting herbicide and fungicide together. I know what happens, um, and, and, and I get it. If you're getting ready to make a herbicide application, you know, it, yeah, it's going to be kind of frustrating to go do the herbicide and then turn around 10 days later and drive over the field again with the fungicide. 
And, and yeah, it might be better to do that, but is it enough better to justify another six bucks to drive across the field again? That's, that's a decision that you'll, you'll have to make for yourself. Um, <clears throat> this other plant, I hadn't looked at this one yet. This, these actually were mid May planted. Um, so this would be, eh, te technically those leaves haven't completely opened up yet. They're still kind of folded. So you could, you could say, I wouldn't count that one. So if you start here, one, two, three, four. So down here at the fourth node, you know, there's, you know, there's not really a, a 16th inch pod there yet, but it, it's close. So I would say this plant would be a, a late R2. So there's a lot of soybeans that get sprayed at, at this stage and we see a benefit from it. And, and would it, would it be better to give this plant another two weeks before you spray it? Let it get bigger, let it get a little further along. I, I personally think it would, but if, if that just doesn't work into your, you know, corn bean Ozarks rotation that you're, that you're shooting for, uh, I, I, I get it that, uh, we, we, we gotta have a life outside of the farm sometimes. And sometimes it's just nice to get stuff done. Um, but you know, R, R3 is the sweet spot. R3 is what, what I'd like to see. And, and in the case of, I think the insecticide benefit can be bigger later. I do think there are situations and this hasn't really been well researched. Uh, I'd like to look into this. I think there are some situations where maybe we don't need another shot of fungicide at R4, R5 and soybeans. But I think a shot of insecticide sometimes at R5-ish would probably be a big benefit in some cases for stink bugs, uh, second generation, you know, uh, bean leaf beetle, other things that can be out there working on working on soybeans. And, and I, a couple of years ago, we had some guys that were making some late applications of insecticide, probably too late on soybeans that were starting to turn already. Uh, at, at that point, it's, you know, if you needed to do it, you needed to do it earlier than that. So I wouldn't go ahead and do it then just because I should have done it three weeks earlier. But um, we do see some, some pretty high insect populations sometimes late uh, in, in, that, uh, in the year in, in soybeans. And I do think there are situations where that fungicide, insecticide you're putting on at R3, that insecticide is not gonna be doing anything for you at R5. And, and there may be some situations where a second shot of insecticide maybe would give an even bigger benefit than fungicide. So, so with that, I think, uh, I think that's everything on my list. Any we, questions? We want to do over to find the bare metal brown spot. Oh, okay. Or... Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so lots of, uh, lots of reported tar spot sightings out there. Uh, I personally haven't seen, you know, real tar spot yet. I'm guessing it's probably there. I probably just haven't been looking in the right spot. Um, but a, a lot of people are finding black specks in corn. Sometimes it's a little bit of insect feeding. And when the, when the insect stops feeding and the tissue turns brown and dies and then turns black at the edge of that insect feeding, that's getting misdiagnosed. That's probably the most common thing because that's, you know, fly, fly poo is, uh, is a little easier to, to figure out because, because if, you, if you lick it, it, it comes off the leaf. So uh, just keep keep that in mind. If you if if the black spot goes away when you lick it, uh, you're just eating some some fly dew there. That's uh, that's not tar spot. Another thing that's not tar spot would be physoderma brown spot, which is what we're looking at here. So so these lesions are yeah they're they're black, but they don't look anything like tar spot. But there's just been a lot of stuff that people find on a corn leaf, and anytime they find something that's a little black speck. Oh my God, tar spots here. Um, you know, it, and it probably is somewhere. Um, and and it's about the time of season we would expect to start seeing it. Um, you know, it, it's it would be unrealistic to expect us to ever get through a season without seeing tar spot. It's it's here. It overwinters here. It's laying in all of the corn residue that's laying in your soybean field. And if you're corn on corn, it's laying. It's in all the corn residue that's laying in your corn field that those, those lesions are going to sporulate, it's going to produce spores, it's going to spread, it's going to infect. It, it's, it's here. Uh, it's here to stay. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to manage through that. Doesn't mean it's going to be bad enough to, you know, kill your corn prematurely like we had happen last year in some cases. Doesn't mean it's going to cause crown rot to flare up like it did last year. 
doesn't mean we're going to have southern rust every year. You know, southern rust has to move in from the south. Southern rust is not over winter here. So if they don't have southern rust in the south and we don't have a storm front that blows the spores up here, you know, we may not have southern rust. There, there are summers when you just basically can't find it. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to have the luxury of having summers where we can't find tar spot. It's always going to be here at some point. Uh, we just need to we just need to manage it and and try to gauge you know what's the pressure how early did it get started how favorable is the weather um what's the odds of it getting really bad to decide whether you're going to make uh, one application or two applications are you going to use a full rate are you going to use a standard rate are you going to use a standard rate twice you know how, how are you going to choose to manage those pathogens uh and and those are all you know personal decisions that uh Unfortunately, we can't make for you because that, that's just kind of that's kind of up to you. So with that, I, I think we'll uh, we'll bring this episode to a close unless there's any last minute questions. If you didn't have time to get your questions in, please email them or text them to me. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get them in next week. Hopefully the podcast uh, is uh, is 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 something that uh, we we can continue and, and people appreciate. And uh, with that, we will be back with you in two weeks, which would be July 28th. 28th. So, so two weeks from today, we'll be back again, probably still talking about fungicide, maybe talking more about tar spot, talking about uh, what other diseases we're seeing. We can talk about uh, how well the crop is pollinated and, uh, and what the crop prospects are, are looking like. Looks great right now. We need to keep getting these timely rains, but uh, you know, most of the crop in, in my geography could couldn't really look better at this stage of the game than it does. So excited to see uh, what uh, what we can what we can accomplish this summer. So everybody take care and be safe. Thanks.